Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a nice lunch. We are continuing the uh, uh, initiative seminar for the area of advanced uh, engineering health. And we are now going to kick off the next part of our program, which is about restoring health, new solutions for rehabilitation. And uh, we're going to see some really interesting uh, contributions in this part. Our first two presentations will be about um, virtual reality software as a way to uh, generate new treatment strategies in psychiatry. And uh, we will also be talking about bone conduction applications on, uh, based on successful long-term interdisciplinary collaboration. So as you should be familiar with by now, collaboration is kind of what we want to highlight with these days. But uh, we're going to kick off by welcoming Almira Thunström, who is an organizational developer and a doctoral researcher at Sahlgrenska University Hospital. Welcome, Almira. Thank you so much. So, and yeah, please go ahead. I will start my presentation. Um, I will be talking about joining worlds and how collaborating with virtual reality software has generated new treatment strategies, a sort of how I met your mother version of how to collaborate in healthcare. And I work in psychiatry, which is the medical study and treatment of mental illness. And why I have one flew over the cuckoo's nest uh, pictured here, because it's such an iconic representation of what the public thinks psychiatry is. And even though the book and the film were great, they only showed a small part, dark part of psychiatry, but it's still such a vivid image and full of misconceptions. We know so much more now about psychiatric diagnosis and there is so much misconception and Hollywood misrepresentations of what it is to have a psychiatric diagnosis. I often see people saying, why do you change your mind all the time? Are you schizophrenic or something? And before the pandemic, I would walk up to strangers and I would correct them because it annoyed me so much. And I would talk about dissociative disorder and go on rants and they get annoyed and I would get annoyed. What I should have done instead is do something that Jennifer Canary Nikolova did. She's an artist researcher, but I love her description on her site, Imagination Navigator. Her sister-in-law had um, psychosis and committed suicide and psychosis is a quite difficult uh, thing to have because you have video, uh, visual and auditory hallucinations which disrupt your quality of life but you also have society in Hollywood mistress re representing you saying that you're a danger to society so you also get um, sort of this societal or societal treatment and Jennifer wanted to create um, experience founded in art and visualization where she took mixed reality headsets so you could embody what it feels like to be someone who has psychosis. Previous uh, researchers and previous uh, in psychiatry and um, in clinical trials, they had done VR versions of this, but it was kind of Hollywoodized as well. This you got to embody. And her prototype, this was over a, a decade and a half ago, triggered something in me and made me realize that you can create prototypes and you can use technology and art together to create new solutions and they don't have to come from healthcare. Thankfully, that was the same idea that the leadership of the psychiatric um, department of affective disorders at Salgrenska had because of a period of a time uh, between two, uh, 2015 and 16, I was unemployed working freelance for government projects, but also as a journalist working with uh, VR um, uh, reviews and writing pop science articles about VR research, because I had for decades been interested in this field. And they saw this while I was applying for work and saw, can you come here for projects and um, test to see if we can use this? Because they had a vision and started hiring people outside of the box to see if they can work with prevention, with development, with new uh, technologies and creating infrastructure for the future. And <clears throat> I was in the right place in geography because previously I had tried to implement these types of projects and they have been 
quite reluctant from psychiatry to implement them. While here in Gothenburg, this department and this leadership opened their arms. And in history, I was in the right place in time because we went from $60,000 per headset, not counting in the computing power, to $600 with, in 2016, where Oculus Rift became commercialized and available at this price, and also $6 cardboard headsets. So VR got cheap, which meant that we, as a public sector hospital, could implement this in theory. Even though it was cheap, it was still not for free. Because even if you had cardboard, you still need phones and you can't expect patients to have them. And you also need content because you can't just slap a pair of VR headset on someone and expect them to feel better while riding a roller coaster. You need targeted treatments. And thankfully, as I had been a PhD student in Karolinska, and but in biology, but I and medicine, but I was keeping an eye on the tech sphere because I was creating prototypes and I was interested in this field. I got a huge network of researchers in this VR field, most of them in America. And we started talking, and there are quite a lot of different validated, well-used tools. You can see by the graphics that most of them were created in the 90s or the early 2000s, but they are still very good. And they're for addiction, for eating disorder, for social phobia, for PTSD. I have another talk where, where I go through these more precisely. But they are created for the lab with the lab funding. So if you want their research, you have to collaborate on a larger scale where the researcher would come and implement this in psychiatry. However, with our immigration laws and with our salary levels and with a ton of other bureaucracy, their time plan for coming and implementing and our time plan for making it possible was not compatible in 2017. So we are still working on it, but in the meanwhile, we realized that huh, maybe we should start looking elsewhere as well, because it might take a while before we can get these things. So we thought about my background, which attracted um, the Department of Psychiatry for hiring me as having this network and working as a journalist. I had interviewed quite a lot of startups having fantastic mental health apps that we could perhaps implement straight away. But then we hit another war called the law of public procurement. The law of public procurement has its ups and its downs. Its ups is that it's there to prevent nepotism and corruption by making sure that everything that is tax funded goes through a procurement so all companies can bid. And it's an open process and you, the company that has the cheapest price but can offer the full quality gets the project. However, you can, as a company, be disqualified if you have a tight knit relationship with someone in the project. And me reaching out to them meant that they were scared. They didn't want to be considered that they had someone inside that would uh, sort of ban them from even getting as far as the procurement. Because we are such a large purchaser, the startups don't, are scared of losing it as a customer. Plus, I was scared of being perceived as someone who's pulling people left and right and giving services. I wanted it to be correct. So I would send my, my emails to a lawyer, a regional lawyer, who probably got very tired of this woman sending her emails to check through so that I didn't sound too, too friendly or too uh, promising of something I couldn't keep. And that built a wall. They said no, and I didn't push which led us to almost despair at the end of 2017 until 2018 rolled in and we started realizing that there could be ways of working with companies, especially startups who have their background in healthcare, whose founders had worked in the public sector and realized the importance of taking this risk because they can do research we can provide honest, unbiased, clear research on their uh, products and be a great testbed collaborator because we're not going to try to, um, we're going to try to see the whole picture. And one of the projects that we started with was quite unexpected. 
here we have disparity in architecture. We have a place in Salgrenska and a place in Astra for uh, Astra for uh, psychiatry to different hospital locations. Same care, same quality, same type of uh, possibilities for treatment, yet different architecture, which can create a disparity because we know that environments are healing. Salgrenska is more clinical and uh, Östra was created knowing this and trying to work with healing environments. But even at Östra, in between wards, despite them looking identical with these beautiful atriums and lights and warm colors, there was still a disparity. We had two inpatient wards, Ward 366 and Ward 362. Ward 366 had these sensory rooms, calm rooms with soft mats, nature-themed walls, uh, soundproof um, uh, fabrics and projecting lights and aromatherapy. Well, in 362, they couldn't uh, have one of those because they would have to get rid of a patient room uh, because of the where they were located. And that is not possible. We do not want to get rid of a patient room. So we were at Vitalis that year in 2018, and we saw a lecture from a company called Mimas. And I had written about them for uh, during my journalism period and was really fascinated with how they were working and how they already were collaborating with healthcare. So me and my colleague caught up with them after their talk and we started talking and my colleague uh, said, uh, oh, it would be nice to find some collaboration. And they said, we, well, we are looking at something called sensory rooms. And me and my colleague looked at each other and said, well, this must be fate <laughs> for some reason. So they came to us and there is uh, the CEO of Mimas, Niklas Wikström, visiting this room. And they had worked on a prototype that we uh, iteratively uh, commented on and wanted to be comparable with our sensory rooms because we wanted to have a clinical trial to see can VR compensate for the physical? Can each room become a sensory room? And we wanted to do that properly because there is no evidence-based, uh, there, there is no evidence for sensory rooms we wanted to explore. And that also trickled uh, away to other researchers and clinicians. So Iris Sarailich and Vukovic, uh, um, Iris Sarailich Vukovic is a senior physician in psychiatry, and she had worked with me on several different uh, projects, among other brain computer interfaces and neurofeedback. And when she saw this, she saw thought PTSD patients have hyperactive systems. So we need to calm them down. If I can do a pilot study to see if this helps my patient, perhaps we can use it in outpatient care as well. And that study will be out in 2021, but the lesson is that it did help. And hearing that, a lot of other wards started asking, can you order us headsets? So eating disorder department wanted it to, for patients to relax after they had had food. So when they would feel anxious, instead of exercising or walking around anxiously, could sit down, pain, before uh, managing pain before, during, after surgery, depression wards, stress treatment, and even addiction wards in Stockholm to use it. And that became sort of this tiny project with sensory rooms gave tools to everyone. And during this project as well, this uh, pilot study that Iris was doing in outpatient care, she also used a uh, Muse um, headset to look at EEG. She was really interested that does this help the hyperactive nervous systems? Does it help with blood pressure? Does it change states of mind? And it actually did. But while we were having this and they were already on the patient, we figured we were already working with neurofeedback. We have this device. Can we find a company that uses VR and these wearables and can create a treatment strategy? And what neurofeedback is in quick, really simplified, is that we have our uh, neurons uh, communicate via electricity. We have five wavelengths of electricity or hertz, and the most, uh, and they are connected to different brain states. Uh, brain states, and uh, one of those is alpha wave activity, where you are most likely to be relaxed. And what you do in traditional 
neurofeedback treatment is that you sit in a PC and then you have a targeted brain area with an EEG cap. So you want to set a um, um, sort of a line, eight to 12 hertz every time the person is focused and clear, you levitate the stimuli or a cargoes or ball rolls. If they lose focus or if they're too tired or if they're too anxious, then the stimuli disappears or the person stops levitating. So you're training the brain to get feedback for when it's doing in the right mind state. And then we started looking around for papers describing apps. And then we found someone called Jeff Tarrant, who is a clinical psychologist, and he was describing this app called Helium. So we looked it up and we tried it. And this is what we experienced. Oh, oh my goodness. You guys have got to experience this. This is so fabulous. That is exactly how we felt when we put it on because you thrust it into this beautiful world that you control with your brainwave activity that give you a sense of a pedagogical sense of where you are in your brainwave activity and what type of breathing exercises and what type of mind states can help you. And CEO Sarah Hill, who is a journalist in her background, co collaborated with medical professionals like Jess, Jeff to create this sort of a treatment strategy. So our lawyers contacted their lawyers because they had a research uh, contract that you could um, enter because they had worked with quite a lot of healthcare before where we retain our data and our rights and we don't share any patient information which you don't in the app. And we are not allowed to resell or change their software. It worked really well. And we started a collaboration with led, which has now led us to do a multi-center study for post-traumatic stress disorder. However, at the time we signed this in 2018, we did not know that we were also creating a solution for a problem that had yet to come, which is the pandemic. You see, <clears throat> The app also works with augmented reality where you can look at different stimuli out into the nature and uh, take this home with you. So this could be um, used at home as well. None of these treatments are treatments as such. They are additive treatments. So you get ordinary treatments as you would treatment as usual, but this could be an extra step and prevention and care for the patients. And now that we have Helium XR and Immerse, we needed to think about our own staff as well, because mental health among our mental health workers really does matter, because we are losing quite a lot of staff in healthcare, and there is not enough people getting educated. And one of, uh, there are quite a lot of work environment issues, but one of them is, um, workplace assaults, which occur 75% of them occur annually healthcare settings. That's quite a lot. And that creates quite a lot of stress and anxiety because we, unlike the military and the police, we also meet violence, but we don't get proper training for it. And one of the things I came up with from my own childhood is that knowing uh, knowledge and information in a sense of uh, agency gave me strength and lessened my stress. I'm the youngest of three uh, and we had one gaming console and we all loved to game, me and my sisters. So I was the always the one last one to do so. So it was quite frustrating, but also quite good because I got to see my sisters go through the, uh, go through the um, different levels of the game. I still saw where they fail, failed and I saw the dangers coming ahead. So I knew sort of how to prepare myself. 
And I figured that must be the case in, re, in um, this form of stress, lowering anxiety and preparation as well for healthcare workers. It's worked for the military and the police. Could it work for us? And they did, uh, there were quite a lot of studies, like one by Gaglioli et al, where they would use um, nurses and teachers who were highly stressed on the verge of burnout, and then let them do virtual reality uh, simulators, training de-escalation and confrontation um, training. And we, <laughs> We thought this must be there must be something for healthcare workers as well. And lo and behold, I found Maria Bauer through a friend who had tested a simulator she had done based on her de-escalation theories and threat and violence in the workplace education. So she's a quite known educator in this. And it, she turned this education theory into a VR scenarios. And you remember mistakes you made better than ones you read about. So you kind of embody the education in VR. And Maria and Axel were kind enough to come to us at the, the psychiatric war, emergency ward and had a meeting with us. And they knew we couldn't afford a simulator, but we uh, went into a research agreement with Framvik AB, who is this company for this simulator. And then we started designing an education. And this is a picture, I'm sorry for the resolution, it was because it's a screenshot of our ER, a virtual reality place where we can train our staff in de-escalation theories, which gives them agency and safety and lowers anxiety according to research. That's what should happen. And also for the patient, if you are anxious and you act out, it's good knowing, to, knowing that the staff is one of the people who know how to steer the wheel, how to de-escalate the situation, keep you and themselves safe. So this is one of the projects I'm looking forward to doing quite a lot of research in. And that was all I had time for. And I want to thank you for listening. If you want more info about any of these projects, you can go to exopsychiatry.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Almira. That was really fascinating stuff. And it sounds like a super immersive and interesting topic to be doing your doctorate in. So congrats on that. Uh, this raises a lot of questions, of course. Uh, my own experience of VR has been mostly from a consumer perspective, that it's a lot for entertainment. And of course, the immersive aspect is obvious, but uh, I did start wondering, given that you are starting from a uh, psychiatric patient perspective, are there any pathologies that sort of get in the way of effectively letting people use a VR uh, headset? Because I imagine that if your perception of reality might not match what the rest of the people around you see, then how receptive are you to being entered into a, a new world like that? That's quite one of those most interesting questions we had. And we did quite a lot of research. And in one of the pages I have in XR Psychiatry, I list what they have done in patients with uh, low function in autism and uh, severe psychosis. And it works well for them as well. Uh, I think there's a misconception there as well that people wouldn't be able to handle it and that they wouldn't, that they aren't good enough um, user experiences that are adapted. But even the designers have thought of this aspect and may, because VR is so intuitive. Uh, it helps people a lot. Even uh, patients with severe dementia, there's quite a lot of studies and user cases. In, for example, Södertälje Kommun, where they, where they film different environments and let uh, dementia patients visit them. And there, there's a talk from Sophia Hemet, who was in this uh, project, where they were worried how this might trigger or how this might be, be very dangerous for the patient, but they realized there were quite a lot of benefits and that, that there was a lot of misconception before you start and fear. Hmm. I guess it might be a bit hard to uh, understand how helpful it is that it's immersive and intuitive. Uh, I was wondering a little bit about uh, the example of that lady you showed who was experiencing something that made her feel very almost euphoric. Is there a um, 
is there uh, always this tendency that people who are within a virtual world try to contact and communicate with people who are still in the regular world? Does that have a difference for any of the research that goes on? Um, yes, it's like uh, when I was administering the VR headsets to patients, they would describe this and they would have these emotional feelings and they, they would really imagine that I was there <laughs> and I couldn't see a thing that they were seeing at that time because they when we started there was no such thing in screen share or casting or anything like that so we we just had to like uh, play along <laughs> like yeah it's a wonderful tree <laughs> But you forget that you are in a virtual world. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked as therapy if you didn't. But you keep assuming that people can feel and see what you can. Mm. Yeah, I kind of felt when you were showing and describing that, that it felt kind of like a weird parallel to having a hallucination because essentially you're having kind of been, you're getting granted the... Um, permission to have your hallucination because the headset is on and it's uh, it's all right that you see things no one else does but are there any kinds of technolo technological opportunities for a shared experience that more than one person can participate in the same virtual world most of the treatment strategies are sort of multiplayer experiences because you don't want to leave a patient alone in an experience that they are supposed to get treatment in so it's often multiplayer so the uh, the headset is for both the the psychologist and for the patient so they're there together experiencing the environment talking about the environment so quite a lot of these are multiplayer very few are just you inside the world or if it's not multiplayer physically, the uh, treat the, the the psychologist or the person treating the patient sees it on a screen and is there close by physically in case they need help. So, how do the uh, caregivers feel about this development? That maybe they'll be spending more of their working day in a virtual world. Is that something that's being met with acceptance and positivity or resistance? quite a lot of pos po positivity, especially those in primary care, because they have 45 minutes and sometimes they don't have time to do exposure therapy on site because it takes time to go into town or find a cafe or find the perfect environment where you can expose the patient to start off with. So having these tools just makes it uh, easier for them to do exposure therapies, for example. So they are very, very open-minded, welcome, because they, they're not losing anything. They're just gaining a tool in their toolbox that can help them with a variety of problems. It's not their only tool, but it's an extra tool. So how widespread is this today? I mean, I kind of imagine this solution must somehow find its way to the patient. But how, what are the pathways that allow this to become accessible to more patients? The pathways is finding uh, passionate and interested caregivers who are willing to implement it. And so far, I have had very little trouble with it because people contact me from all over Sweden interested in what we've done, how they can implement it. For example, now we have a multi-center study with a center in Tranos, which we would have never collaborated with unless they heard about this um, neurofeedback treatment and that we wanted to do a clinical trial. So people are, um, it's a word of mouth sort of thing. This is probably going to trigger a few centers being interested in also taking in some of the solutions. So we're there, there's no problem of uh, getting the word out. There are some difficulties, as I've mentioned before, some bureaucratical uh, reasons why we can't do things, but there's always a will. That's fantastic. Um, I did want to round off by asking you, what is the hardest thing with doing this kind of research? You kind of touched on it, but is is that it, the public procurement stuff? Um, no, uh, it is uh, also, uh, right now it's the pandemic, of course, because it's such, uh, it's thing that touches your face, so you can't share it with anyone and you have to have long periods between, like sort of looking at how you can sanitize 
that's one of the things. Plus, um, uh, a procure procurement in another sense is that the hardware is hard to sort of uh, scale up. We are working on, on that currently as a hospital to make sure that nobody has to go and purchase their own equipment, but that we have that widely available, that you can snap your fingers and have that on site. Uh, currently, it's really difficult because I have to sit and order things. Uh, I feel like a technician uh, more. Um, I, I think sometimes I joke that El Gigante and all of them should give me commission because all of the stuff I buy <laughs> for the hospital. <laughs> so I feel like one of their customer service members rather than a researcher at times. And I wish I could get that out of the way and have a region that realizes that this is important. We need to get this technology uh, readily available and so that we, we don't have to fight and have difficulties getting it. Thank you very much for giving us this insight into your fantastic work. We uh, are really happy that we got the privilege to hear you. So we have to move on in our program. Thank you very much, Almira, for Thank everything. You. See you. And uh, I will turn over the word to Martin. Yes, thank you. And I, I must agree, it was a fantastic uh, presentation, Almira. So thank you very much. Uh, I think we will see something, uh, well, not similar, but as fantastic in, in the presentations to come. The first one up is from uh, Trio. It's uh, Dr. Sabine Reinfeld, Associate Professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering here at Chalmers. Uh, together with Professor Bo Håkansson at the same department, also Chalmers then and Associate Professor Mons Eg Olsson at the Department of Ontolary... No, I was practicing this before. Ontolary... Young... I cannot even pronounce it. You have to say it, Mons, later. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, head and neck surgery at Solgenska Academy at the University of Gothenburg. And we will hear about uh, bone conduction clinical research through a long-lasting collaboration. So again, sorry for my lack of pronunciation, but very welcome to, to this virtual stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's, yeah. it's called otorhinolaryngology, I had an neck surgery, and you are very much excused. It's very hard to pronounce. I've Thank done you. it like a thousand times. So I, I think I did it 30 times, so it didn't help. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, before we, we start off, I just want to be absolutely clear about the research that Sabine and, and Bo and I do together, that you guys couldn't do this without me. And you couldn't do it without us, Mons. Is that really so? <laughs> Let's see. I agree with you. I do. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to talk about hearing and balance. Hearing, I think hearing is one of those senses that... Uh, many uh, regard as something natural that, that you don't think about having a hearing loss. But if you have a hearing loss, uh, of course, depending on the severity of the hearing loss, uh, you will lose some ability of uh, communication at work, in social activities, in your private life, and it will affect your whole well-being, actually. Hearing loss can be divided in three different Parts. It's sensory neural hearing loss, and then it's the cochlea, the hearing organ itself, that is malfunctioning. Conductive hearing loss is when the sound is somehow obstructed on its way into the cochlea. It can be, for example, ear canal atresia, perforation of the eardrum, chronic discharging ears, or middle ear ossicle stiffness, for example. <clears throat> then we have a combination of both uh, these, and it's called mixed hearing loss. Balance basically is about how to get around and it's, it's about the range of your mobility in the surroundings. And if you have balance disorders, it also affects your social activities, your private life, and also, of course, your well-being. If we look at hearing and balance, they are actually very tightly connected in the area here, the balance organ here and the hearing organ here. So anatomically very close, and they actually share the same brain fluid. So it's not very unusual that if one system is affected, the other one is also affected. So 
So yes, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, collaboration and um, there have been a very a long history of interdisciplinary collaboration between Chalmers and the Salgrenska Academy. Uh, and I look back into the Chalmers history, which is very well documented. And you may know we have this book, Shalma Martyr, and it's available in seven volumes. And in volume number five, you can find this article here um, from 1972. And it says that here in Gothenburg, we had the biggest world conference ever in biomedical engineering uh, that year. You see the names, uh, Henry Wallmann and Robert Magnusson, uh, that was the professors that started biomedical engineering at Chalmers in the 50s. And you can also see uh, the arm uh, showing up here. Uh, that was the key project those days, the Sw Svenhund, and it was called. Which is still, as you have heard about yesterday, is a, a very interesting project nowadays with implanted electrodes. You can further look into this article and see that there was no coincidence that this was the third ever actually conference uh, that it went to Gothenburg because it's a result of close collaboration between the engineers at Chalmers and medical professionals at Salgrenska. That was very well known already those days. And there is one more quote here. It's from Professor Magnusson. He was my PhD supervisor when I was a PhD student. And he says here in the article, I translated it, we at Chalmers have been able to run around at Salgrenska like children at home. And I will show you a little bit later that it was also the uh, other way around. Uh, um, in that atmosphere, in the end of the 1970s, this very interesting project, the Bone Anchored Hearing Aid, was started uh, by the, uh, the pioneers, Professor Chelström and Professor Bronemark. And here also the, one of the first three patients, Mona Andersson. And today it has been a, a great success with more than 300,000 patients operated worldwide. And when I look back uh, for what are the success factors, so it's, uh, I come up with four. And of course, there, there should be a clear patient need. These patients, they have a problem in the middle ear. They have a conduction hearing loss, as Mons told you about. And we offered them a, a new and very efficient solution. But this type of projects could never exist without very strong interdisciplinary collaboration. It's simply impossible. And also to reach out clinically, you need to have collaboration with companies. So entrepreneurship is very important. And here is the efficient solution, the bone anchored hearing aid. And simply speaking, you can say that it is direct stimulation of the skull bone instead of having the skin in between as in previous systems. And patients don't feel anything, they just hear. And that is based on a uh, uh, fantastic um, discovery already in the 1950s about osseointegration by Professor Bronemark. He discovered that titanium has very unique properties, allowing bone tissue to grow directly onto the bone surface. And the first application was a dental application which has grown dramatically all over the world and he became honorary doctor at Chalmers for that in 1995. But this product wouldn't have been a success without Professor Chelström, who is, a, you can regard him as the father of bone anchored hearing aid and craniofacial reconstruction surgery. So not only bone anchored hearing aids could be attached with this implant, but also lost uh, nose, ears, eyes, now back to the 70s, and here you can see him quite young, a PhD student uh, doing the first measurements on Mona Anderson, the first patients. And this is uh, at Chalmers, so it was the other way around. And here is a picture 40 years later, the 40 year anniversary, same patient. And Mona is today enjoying the eighth generation of the Baja. Maybe it's even the ninth generation. I have to check it up. Uh, and at the same meeting, both the doctor and the patient still happy. I think that that could be the final proof of concept after 40 years. So I, this is one slide, just summarizing the bone conduction hearing projects I've been working with for the last 40 years plus. The first 20 years, I was working with these bone anchored hearing systems and we have close collaboration with two companies, Cochlear Bone Anchored Solutions and Oticon Medical, both based here in Gothenburg and they are working internationally. 
We also developed some accessories, a skull simulator, and, and they are sold by a Danish company, Intraacoustics, and the Canadian company, AudioScan, today. For the last 20 years, we uh, have been focused on this bone conduction implant, which is the next generation uh, of the bone anchored hearing aid. And in that project, I developed a new transducer principle that we found other applications. And one application was consumer products, uh, and other companies was involved there. And um, a little bit later, we uh, looked into hearing diagnostics and uh, developed the B81 transducer with this, with this uh, best transducer inside. And five years ago, we started this vestibular diagnostics, the balance organ diagnostics with B250. Uh, there should be one more little slide there, but I don't see it. And there it is. Audibility uh, verification, which is the latest and maybe uh, right now the hottest projects. I will come back to talk about these two latest projects a little bit later, but now I'll leave over to Sabine. Thank you. So you got to hear about the bone anchored hearing aid, which is attached with a screw behind the ear. Um, that includes the skin penetration. Uh, so even though it's been the golden standard for, for many years now, uh, in the world of bone conduction devices, it triggered some, uh, it triggered the development of implantable devices. Uh, to have an intact skin would improve a lot. Um, and, but that could be done in different ways. But we think that the one with direct drive stimulation is, is the most feasible, um, is the best for most patients. Um, and as Bo mentioned, direct drive stimulation is when you stimulate directly into the bone and not having the skin in between. Uh, so Bo had the idea already in 1998 to, uh, to use an inductive link uh, to keep the skin intact. And then he developed this uh, small transducer to fit the bone, um, which is called BEST. And it, it's, it is really good, balanced electromagnetic separation transducer. It's small and effective, and it also includes a high frequency boost, which is not, which was not the, um, uh, which was not in the in the previous Baja transducers. And you see here at the bottom some principal design of the audio processor, which is the outer part, and the bridging bone conductor, which is uh, the implant. So. The sound is picked up by a microphone. We have a battery on the outside also, nothing like that in the, uh, in the implant. Digital signal processor, and then some you have amplitude modulation to be able to uh, uh, drive over the skin, the induction link, and demodulator, and then finally reaching the transducer, which gives the vibrations directly into the bone. Oops. Um, and here you see more pictures. You see some um, uh, some measures here. So it's, you see that it's small size. Um, you see that also from from the picture here. The person holding it. I think it's Mons. Um, and here you see that the the audio processor is on the outside, and you have an implant here. And the implant is positioned closer to the cochlea as compared to the bar is. Um, and that, that means that we win a bit in, uh, in transmission to the cochlea. Um, but that is also needed because we lose a bit in uh, induction link, a few dB. So by having it closer and having this uh, high frequency boost, um, it, it helps to, to gain the same um, uh, transmission to the cochlea. And now I leave over to Mons. Uh, all right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so before I go on with the surgical pictures, and I would like just to remind anyone who is very sensitive of uh, surgical photographs uh, that you shut your eyes, then it's not very serious actually, but if anyone is sensitive. Before I go on, uh, I'd like to say something about Professor Bo Håkan. So I'm very proud, actually, to be one of the researchers who have had the great pleasure to work with uh, uh, Professor Bo Håkansson. 
He was appointed honorary doctor at Sorginsk Academy 2020. No celebration yet towards, uh, because of the pandemic, but there will be, I'm sure. Uh, Professor Bo Håkansson has made a fantastic uh, contribution to bone conduction physiology and bone conduction hearing for so many people all over the world. You are so well uh, deserve this, Josef. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, BCI surgery. And I'd like to point out some key points here. It should be safe and it should be simple. Safe for a patient and simple surgery. So when we do this, there is limited drilling in the bone behind the ear. The <clears throat> transducer has a direct contact to the bone, as Sabine was talking about. We use a titanium wire to secure the transducer down towards the bone. And before closing the wound, we verify that the implant is working. This is the first patient that was operated in 2012. Uh, first of all, we just draw the outlines. Where do we want the implant under the skin? Then we do this incision behind the ear. We make a small pocket here for the antenna part of the implant, and then we fold the ear uh, forwards. Then we start to drill this uh, 12 times 14 millimeter recess and approximately three to five millimeters down uh, to the bone. So it's very far from delicate structures like a big vein close by and the dura in the facial nerve, for example. And then we drill small holes on the edges here of the recess to let the titanium wire to go like that. And then we put the implant in place and we tighten the titanium wire so that the transducer is really tight towards the bone. Then we stimulate uh, the implant and in different ways measure the sound pressure that the implant creates if it works. And in this patient group, we have made something called the nasal sound pressure, actually measuring the sound pressure in the nose for practical uh, reasons in the OR. And then we close the wound like that. So in summary, uh, easy surgery, limited drilling, small size of recess, and we don't go far down in the bone, far from delicate structures, and that is safe surgery. Okay, Sabine, I think it's you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so these patients that we have, we have 16 so far uh, in the clinical study. Uh, we follow them up uh, in a rather tight schedule. At first, before the surgery, they, they get to test uh, Baha on a soft band uh, for four weeks, which is used as a reference device for us. And uh, we test it after four weeks with um, different audiometric tests, so hearing tests with tones and uh, speech, and uh, also questionnaires to check the uh, quality of life. And then they have a surgery, and we fit the uh, external audio processor after four weeks. And we do all of these testings again uh, with this BCI then. And we follow up after one, three, six, and 12 months after fitting, and also after three and five years. And you see a lot of bars down to the right. Um, it's all the different patients. 13 first are from Gothenburg and three in Stockholm. And you see how many years now that they had the implant. And if we add all of these together, we are now up to 99 years today. Uh, so almost 100 years accumulated time. And during all this time, we had no serious adverse event reported. Um, I also want to tell you about a long-term study that we have with one implant. Uh, so that implant gets to listen to uh, radio P1 24 hours per day uh, in a quite high volume to accelerate uh, the use of it. And if we calculate with a 12 hour uh, per day usage, then this implant has now lived for 42 years. A little bit of results. We have um, uh, published uh, quite a few papers on this and uh, now. First month for the first patient, six months for first six patients, and one year for 16 patients, and three years for 10 patients. <laughs> uh, so what is in common for all of them is that um, 
we see that we have a significant improvement compared to unaided situation. We also have similar or better improvement compared to the reference device, the Vaha on a soft band. But what we really wanted to measure, uh, to compare with, with is a Vaha on a screw, because that's better. Uh, we don't have the skin in between. Uh, so we did a match study uh, in the beginning, um, matching six Vaha patients with our first uh, six BCI patients with the same hearing loss, age, and gender, and we got really similar results for both of these groups. So we see the same rehabilitation effect, but then with a major advantage of having an intact skin. Oh. Okay, uh, thank you. And I would say something about our latest and maybe most uh, exciting project at the moment. It's about objective measurement of audibility when we have a bone conduction device, um, it's very hard for us to know exactly in an objective way what the patients really hear. We can test thresholds, but we don't know exactly how they hear the speech. We cannot put a sensor in the cochlea, but we can put a, a microphone on the forehead. And that microphone listens to the sound that is transmitted through the skull. Uh, and um, the idea is to measure the thresholds with this surface microphone, the skin microphone, uh, and have the thresholds here uh, and web frequencies down here. And we can also increase the sound so this device is on maximum. It cannot deliver anything more. That's maximum power output. So everything this patient can hear is between these two curves. And now we can. Um, uh, send out, transmit speech signal at different levels through a speaker and see where it ends up in between these two, um, the thresholds and the maximum power output. And if it's not perfectly in between so the patient hear everything, we can adjust with the programming of the device. So this is a way to do this in an objective way. And we, ha we are very early and we have done a pilot study on normal subjects, actually ourselves, Maybe you can identify the patient here or the subject. We use an intensive device We're on a soft band towards the skin. And this is the average thresholds among us, five. And this is the blow uh, squares or the maximum. And then we have three levels of sound, 55, 65, 75. And you can regard the red area as a speech banana. And you can see that almost all speech sounds are heard, except maybe for the highest frequencies. But we have normal hearing in most of these frequency range, so this was expected. But this is a fitting tool that we now want to try on devices, on patients. And uh, then we have the other project started maybe five years ago, where we are looking into diagnosis of vertigo and dizziness, and it's a balance organ. You may know about the um, semicircular canals. Um, but there are also two others, uh, the utricular and saccule, which are responsible for the static balance. And in the late 1990s, it was discovered that the saccule and utricle is also called otolytic organ. Uh, if they are mechanically excited sufficiently, they will um, release a muscular reflex. Uh, and that can be used in order to diagnose where the problem could be. There are a lot of branches in the nerve here. Many things can happen. And that can be excited by either air or bone conduction. And there are two types. Either you, uh, if you excite the um, saccule, you will have a muscular response in the cervical muscle. And if you excite the utricle, you will have a response in the eye, the oblique eye muscle. And um, previously, the, the common standard is to use air conduction, very high sound pulses that goes in here and excites these utricle and saccule. But the problem is that that requires very high sound and you need to do it maybe 200 times in a row in order to do every to get a signal, a very small signal out from here. Uh, and that's like having a machine gun in the ear. And uh, there could also be a problem if the patient has a problem in the middle ear, then you don't even get any response. So therefore we have designed a new transducer to be 250 we call it the Smurf for maybe obvious reasons. And that's, that's simply adapted to a frequency range where we know it's more efficient to excite these reflex and it's much stronger than alternative uh, devices. And then we have already done a first clinical study on, on 30 normal subjects and found that we can now reach the threshold at 
40 dB less sound level, which is much more comfortable, of course, for the patient and no risk for hearing impairment. And we are in the phase to, uh, to study different syndromes on patients and planned and ongoing. Sorry. Mons, are you there? I'm there. I'm here. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Then about collaboration, what do we do together then? When, when it comes to invention of the devices and, and technical knowledge, of course, the main contributor is uh, Chalmers. But then, for example, with the BCI, we have had a lot of discussions and different research projects about the design, the position of the implant close or far away from the, from the ear or ear canal or cochlea, the shape and the size, for example. And we, we uh, together also, we do applications to Läkemedelsverket when we need to and the ethical review board. Um, we go to conferences uh, together for professional networking, um, introducing each other to, to uh, our networks, extending them. Um, we apply for funding together, helping each other in different applications. And of course, the, um, prepare for different studies um, in the study design and we need each other's competences to be able to to do this in a good way. And then of course doing the actual and planned study and we are working with papers together writing back and forwards and then we share supervisor for example I was co-supervisor to Christiana Regato who did her dissertation a few years ago when both Bo and Sabine are co-supervisors to my doctoral students here at Sargansk. And then as today, we do presentations together. Uh, and then when it comes to collaboration with the industry, we also uh, do this together. And of course we need some reflection together. Um, so just to sit down together and see how are we doing? Uh, do we need to change anything in our research? projects, uh, what is the next step? So what, what is the future of this research area? What can we do? What can we contribute with in our team? Get some new ideas. Yes, as you, you have mentioned, we go to many conferences all over the world. And uh, maybe one of the most memorable ones was to Lake Louise 2019 in Canada. Fantastic uh, place. Uh, this is mid-May, still the ice on the lake, and there are five glaciers surrounding this place. Uh, afterwards, we went on um, hiking and uh, walking in, in fantastic national parks. And if you see the, 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 um, the nature behind my face, uh, the forest there, that's from uh, walking and talking in that um, uh, national park, and uh, suddenly, if I land my size, there was a big, huge grizzly bear just in front of us. And um, my colleagues, they were very frightened, so they turned around and ran for their lives. But I stayed. And I got a number of photos. <laughs> and, and that's how it is also in uh, maybe in, in, in biomedical projects. There are risks and rewards. And here is the reward for that photo. <laughs> so. Yes, that was amazing. Next slide, and it's fine. Yes, so uh, with that, we would like to thank everyone. Here is the current members of the multidisciplinary bone conduction hearing group. Uh, so we'd like to thank everyone here and uh, all previous members also who have contributed to this work that we're presenting here today. And thank you all for listening. We have thank you. maybe time thank you. for questions. Thank you very much. I think uh, you gave uh, a fantastic overview of a long-lasting collaboration, which impresses me a lot. I, I cannot even imagine what it takes to, to keep this collaboration going, but you seem to have found a good recipe. And, and thank you for also sharing some of the things that you do together that, that could be an inspiration to the rest of us. Um, so, but I would like to start off, we don't have time for many questions, but why has it this collaboration within hearing aids or, or uh, hearing impairment been so long-lasting and successful? Is it, I mean, 
I, I will leave it at that. You gave a lot of ex explanations of things you do, but what do you think has been the secrets for uh, this? Maybe, maybe Bo, you want to comment? Well, yeah, we have focused on the bone conduction area, and that, that has not been a great focus in, in the world, especially not in the 70s. It was regarded as a last resort, and by the innovation by, by Professor Bronemark and uh, this, this direct stimulation, it opened up a lot of questions. So we had to redo all the research, I could say, and, and then we have just found, I mean, it was thought to be uh, not a, um, a full quality sound that way, but we showed it was, and then we found also other applications, so we can use bone conduction in many ways, and it opens a really big research window, and we're still finding new applications. Yeah, I think the thing with the, the skin microphone was was very interesting. To, so you can also quantify what what people actually hear in in some sense. Um, Mons, you said that the surgery and the implant or, or positioning the implant should be safe and simple. And it seems like uh, it's it's so much intrusion, and you stay away from these critical areas. But do you have any challenges related to infection? I'm thinking about what we heard in the beginning of of today with, with implants and the biofilms that can form and so on? That is something that we are always always aware of, of course, and it's it's meticulous with, with sterility and, and uh, stuff like that, of course. But there is always a risk of infection and, and you have to be prepared for it. Um, but we have been lucky so far as so we haven't had any uh, such problems actually. When it comes to the simplicity and the safety of the implant, I think it's very important to emphasize that in order to reach out to as many patients as possible, it's not enough that, for example, we do the surgery at the university hospitals. It's important that you can do the surgery whatever uh, you work with ENT surgery. So uh, in, if it's safe and if it's simple, you will reach out to more patients, I think. Yeah, that's, that's definitely so. I'm I'm sure of it. Uh, we should give everyone a chance to have a short break. Uh, before that, we will also get some exercise so we can uh, stay alert for the upcoming presentations. But again, thank you so much to all three of you. I think it was a, a very nice overview and a very well presented uh, presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great to hear, and uh, now it has fallen upon my lot to uh, give a little uh, stretching uh, regime before we go on a break. We won't fill the whole, um, we won't fill the entire break time, I promise, but just a few things. We're actually going to start sitting down, because I think it's good to learn a few sitting stretches also. We're going to do the first one that I did yesterday, that you uh, braid your fingers together, put your hands on top of your head, and again, as we did yesterday, point one elbow at a time toward the ceiling and try to lift your ribs toward the ceiling rather than collapsing over to the side. So this should give you a nice side stretch in the rib cage and everything in between. Okay, come up to the middle and then tilt the other way. And if you want, you can also look upward toward the ceiling, making sure that you are pointing your elbow toward the, toward the roof, I guess. And hang out there for a bit. Remember to lift your rib cage, and then come back to the middle. And uh, now we're going to try something that might look a little bit complicated. I want you to take your elbow and place it on the outside of your opposite knee. This should give you a little bit of torso twist. And with your other arm, try and open up so that you have your chest pointing toward that wall. And maybe look up toward the ceiling here. And uh, you can regulate how much pressure you put on your tw twist by pushing with your arm that is on your leg. Okay, come down softly. And we'll try the other side. Put your elbow on the outside here of your knee and open up with the other arm. I imagine this looks pretty, but I can't look forward right now. So <laughs> here's hoping. And hang out here for a while. Don't forget to breathe. All right, and push and come back down. Okay, and now as we get up, we don't get up all the way. We get up so that we're a little bit bent forward, put your hands on your knees, and then draw circles that go about to the level of where your toes are, and around, try to get behind your ankles. 
the other way, do it a few rotations to either side. And if it's not obvious, I am going to aim towards stretching out what has been uh, compacted while we've been sitting down. So now, if we stretch up a little bit, uh, we form a Charlie's Angels point with our fingers and our knuckles like this. Put it over your head. Try to get behind your ears if you can. And then push upward as much as you can. Let your shoulders lift toward your ears. And then push them down. So you still have this pyramid shape, but a bit of space between your ears and your arms. Now try tilting a little bit to either side. Martin and I are doing this beautiful symmetrical thing right now. Also here, try lifting your ribs that are facing the roof a little bit upward. Come softly to the middle. And the other side, of course. Should have had some uh, fancy schmancy music to this, I think. We'll remember <laughs> that for next initiative seminar. You can imagine. Yes, exactly. Come up to the middle, and now I want you to grab your opposite uh, shoulders, like this, forming a V with your arms, and try pushing your elbows down toward the floor while you try and lower your shoulders a little bit. This should give you a nice little neck stretch. And if you want, you can try tilting them a little bit, see if that makes a difference for you. Okay, now we're going to try for our hip flexors. So I want one foot to be slightly in front of the other. I'll stand this way so you can see properly. I, now will, the, I will not. All right, excellent. This is very pedagogical. Now the trick is to imagine that your backbone continues into a tail. Now take the end of that tail, pull it up between your legs, and tilt your hips forward. This is supposed to give you a nice stretch here in the hip flexor. So you can just hang out here for a while. I hope it makes a difference. This is, this is a part that very much gets compressed if we sit down throughout the day. Now we can try rotating to the other side, like so. And same thing here. Take your hip and tilt it upward. You should feel it here, where the pocket is on your jeans, basically. Somewhere here, yes. Yeah. And hang out there for a while. All right, and come back. And just to finish off, I just think it's good to do the thing we did yesterday. So again, we'll form the American football goalpost with our arms. Try to squish together your trapezius muscles and bring together your shoulder blades. All right, looks good. <laughs> Everyone looks like they're being held hmm. up. And tip your hands downward like this so you get the opposite effect. So this uh, works your arms and your shoulders and your deltoids and whatever else their names are. And then finally, push straight backward, straight arms like this, and let them swing. All right, you're good. So Thank you, Cecilia. Yeah. That was good. Go take a break, and we'll see you back at quarter past. And we're back. Uh, and I'm happy to be here on the stage together with two representatives from uh, Press Size, a company that has formed from a joint research collaboration between uh, Solgenska, Chalmers and University of Borås. And with me here I have uh, Josefin Dam, who is uh, one of the co-inventors behind what we will be here more about today and also Chief Technology Officer for Precise. Welcome. And Andreas Nilsson, uh, PhD and CEO of Precise. So really happy to have you here and eager to hear more about uh, your sort of approach to medical compression. Thank you Please. so much. So we will talk about medical um, dosage in medical compression treatment. And um, as we heard here, uh, my name is Josephine. I'm the co-inventor and co-founder of Precise. And my fellow colleague here and co-presenter Andreas is the CEO. Bandaging is one of the most ancient treatment methods in history. However, in 2017, two of the world's most well-renowned researchers in compression therapy published the following statement. In fact, uh, the medical field of compression treatment is maybe the only one where quantitative dosage has almost never been measured, despite outcomes largely depending on it. So in other medical areas, it would be unaccepted to give a dose of medicine without knowing what you're giving. 
About 400 BC, Hippocrates stated that an upright position should be avoided for a person with a leg ulcer. And this shows a healthy vein. When the valves are open, the blood can freely move toward the heart. When the valves close, they act like check valves and prevent backflow. However, about 60% of the older population is affected by venous insufficiency, which is when the valves cannot close and work as intended. This creates turbulence and backflow and causes blood to collect and pool in the legs. This leads to various stages of venous insufficiency, like pain, swelling, skin changes, varicose veins, and in the last and worst stage, an active venous ulcer. For all of these stages, though, compression treatment with bandages and stockings is crucial to improve circulation and restore the venous return. Although, given the quote I just read, one would suspect that today's treatment is not really optimized. Or what do you say, Andreas? Well, um, let's have a look at what the research literature says about uh, achieving dosage in compression with compression bandages. A large German study uh, from 2017 where uh, almost a thousand healthcare personnel were instructed to apply a compression bandage to between 50 and 60 millimeters of mercury. And it uh, turned out that only 12% achieved the actual target pressure. And perhaps worse, the range was between 6 and 173 millimeters of mercury. If we would just for a minute, uh, consider this study to be about a drug and one pill containing uh, 10 milligrams, then the prescribed do daily dosage would be between five and six pills. But uh, in the end, the patients will actually receive between half a pill and over 17 pills. That is the range. And I'm sure that we can all agree on that this would not be considered a proper medical treatment for, at least not for most drugs. This is just a visualization why dosage needs to be uh, in the future in compression treatment. Um, and this study was uh, done on well-trained healthcare personnel. A lot of compression treatment is done by home care and also the patients themselves. So a proper compression product needs to be easy for self-care. Uh, since I have a master's in electrical engineering from Chalmers, my approach to solving the problem would probably be to implement pressure sensors and electronics into a bandage. And this could be considered engineering health, of course, and also sort of a smart solution. And I'm even sure that we could uh, find a super cool high-tech solution uh, for this. And, um, but we, is this really a smart solution or is it a technology-driven solution? Because this will for sure add complexity for the end users like the patients and also the nurses. And it will drive the cost uh, for the device. And we will now uh, hear about a much better solution for the problem. Well, at least a bit more simplified, I think. So the original question, if it would be possible to create a bandage that always deliver the same pressure invariant of the applier or the user or the leg size was asked by Ernie Matson, professor in vascular surgery. The person he asked was Turbin Lund, professor um, in biomathematics here at Chalmers and whom you might know from the last session where he was a moderator yesterday. So Turbin realized that to describe the pressure obtained from a bandage on a leg, one can use a simply modified and simplified version of Laplace law. And about 10 years ago, I was working at the Swedish School of Textiles um, with the initiative Smart Textiles, and I was handed this project, and I was really intrigued by the smart and genius mathematical solution to the problem. And I started to investigate whether it would be possible to develop a bandage material that would actually meet the specific elastic properties needed to create such a bandage. And it turned out that it was. 
So um, in 2016, Andreas joined our team and with his background as a PhD in medical research in compression in the lower legs, he was a perfect match to our team. And his main task has been uh, clinical studies and also bringing the product to the market. And for us, having a cross-disciplinary team from early on has been crucial for our product and for the development of this device. So as mentioned before, one can use a slightly modified version of Laplace law to describe the pressure obtained from a bandage on a leg. So where the pressure equals the force, that is how much you stretch the bandage material, times the overlap, or usually the thickness, but in this case, the number of layers of bandage material times the curvature, and that is the curvature on the leg in this case. So when the curvature goes down, or when the leg gets larger, one has to increase the force in order to maintain a constant pressure. So the overlap can quite easily be controlled by adding a longitudinal guideline for application like this. However, it's a bit more complicated to control um, the force needed to compensate for the difference in curvature. So as you remember from before, when the curvature goes down, or in this case, the leg gets larger, like the calf, one needs to increase the force. And by placing cross lines distributed along the bandage with even distances like this, that are aligned along the shin bone once applied like this, one has to stretch more on the larger parts of the leg where the curvature is less and stretch less on the thinner parts of the leg where the curvature is more sharp. And by precisely calculating the elastic properties needed, one can design a bandage material where the elastic properties of the force and curvature always balance each other in order to achieve a well-defined pressure invariant of leg size and shape. So this means that the pressure will not all only be constant along the leg, but also for different leg sizes. And if you have a swelling that goes down, the pressure still is the same due to the smart um, self-adjusting textile material. So this uh, picture here illustrates the same study that Andreas described to us before, and compared to their results, the Lundetex medical bandage assures 100% precise dosage in compression treatment. So, so far we have only discussed bandages, but as mentioned before, compression stockings are also widely used for the same indications. So, now Andreas will guide you through compression stockings. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, compression stockings are, like Josephine said, used for the same indications, but also used for preven prevention, for preventing a new ulcer forming and also for preventing leg swelling and edema. Uh, however, the, the difficulties and the challenges are more or less the same. We have different leg shapes and leg sizes, and usually we see a large variation in pressure uh, in the products. And also we have a problem with fitting a correct size stocking to these all these different leg shapes and leg sizes. The patient often complain that it's hard to put on or impossible to put on and take off a, a stocking themselves. So they need healthcare personnel or home care to help them put on the stockings in the morning and removing them in the evening. Um, we have tried to uh, uh, address some of these challenges by uh, designing a stocking with the same smart material as used in the bandage that will give us uh, dosage at all times and also uh, much easier to find a stocking that will actually fit the patient. Uh, it is also easier to put on and take off for the patients themselves. If we look at a small study, uh, where we measured the pressure at two locations on the leg. We can see that the uh, pressure is varying very little with uh, small or larger leg sizes. 
the reason for including this uh, slide in the presentation is that we actually use the same one stocking for all eight healthy subjects and that indicates that it's quite easy to find a stocking that actually delivers the dosage on the patients. This is a typical uh, venous leg ulcer. The duration uh, was over six months before the nurse applied a wound dressing and a medical, the Lundatex medical bandage. After one month, the wound was better, uh, or the ulcer was better, uh, and then the patient could switch to using a Lundatex stocking instead of the bandage for better self-care, because it's always easier for um, the patients themselves to put on the stocking than wrapping themselves with a bandage. After three months, the ulcer was healed. Um, the patient, an older, an older lady, had a history of previous venous leg ulcers that usually healed in six months with com conventional compression, uh, compression treatment. Now it healed in half that time. The nurse um, treating the lady um, estimated that the clinic's visits could be 50% less with better self-care. So the total number of visits may have been seven, reduced by 75%. And so getting dosage into compression treatment and also improving self-care may cut costs and also improve the quality of life for the patients. The nurse said that this patient is very compliant and loves the stocking as it is the first time she can take on and off a compression stocking herself. Um, we have, um, the products are designed for better self-care um, and that means that we have built in a user guide for easy application and the smart textile always assures that we have the correct dosage. And the stocking, of course, is designed for self-care and easy management and prevention. Um, so we have put dosage into compression treatment for the first time. Um, and, but this, none of this, like you said, have been, would have been possible without the cross-disciplinary team. Thank you very much. I think that was, uh, again, a very nice presentation. And um, the first thing I bring from this is uh, that I see that you have used a very, or you have a very nice application of what we call the pressure vessel equations to calculate stresses in pressure vessels. And you turn it around and you used it for uh, medical applications. So I think this is some equations that most engineers that are educated here at Chalmers should know. But stress. maybe maybe not right. used in this way. <laughs> um, so maybe that's where I will start. So it's sort of, in a way, a simple idea. At least the the relation between the tension in the band and or the bandage and uh, the pressure that you get. Uh, you have all these kind of bandages around. So what is what is your competitive edge? Is it the textile then, or how do you compete? Um, yeah. Uh, w yeah, for sure. There is. Um, there are other bandages on the market that has sort of um, indicators, like uh, an oval, and when you stretch it a certain bit, it becomes a circle, and then you know that you have uh, sort of a fixed uh, tension in the bandage, mm -hmm. and that will, of course, like narrow down this 6 to 173 range to something. But if you look at that equation we showed, uh, that solution means that in that equation, they have selected uh, tension, the force, as the constant. And of course, the pressure will then vary with the curvature. Mm -hmm. So the, the co the, we see the different. We have selected pressure as the constant, and then we the other needs to be variables to control it. So it, but I mean, uh, we, we, we must give them, it, that is a good approach, uh, unless you have uh, much better than having nothing. Uh, so it's not a bad idea to have the tension mm -hmm. fixed, but it's, of course. It's not the optimal uh, uh, No, solution. it's not the optimal because you will have different leg shapes and also mm -hmm. different sizes on the same leg. But, but keeping the tension 
I think it's like measuring what you can measure rather than measuring what you want. So you are yeah. sort yeah. of targeting yeah. the real, uh, the important thing, the pressure, rather than something that is secondary that, that you sort of can relate. So I think that sounds very, very smart. There was also a question from the audience, uh, more out of curiosity. So how does, um, let me see, how does regular leg compression compared to uh, body inversions, like uh, being upside down or uh, putting your legs high. Can you sort of relate? Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It you can take that one. Yeah. yeah um, yes, it, of course, it has an impact, like whether you are standing or laying down. And, and that is um, especially important for patients with some arterial insufficiency as well, because then you don't want to apply too high pressure because um, obviously, like when you're standing, the pressure is higher in your feet, like mm -hmm. your internal blood pressure is higher in your feet than in your brain, for example. So you want to compensate that with adding the right dosage on your leg, which means that um, in order to compensate for the higher pressure, well, depending on your venous um, problem, say if you, if you have an ulcer, sometimes it requires like not only like a, a precise dosage of compression, but also a higher pressure when you're standing up than when you're lying right. down. Mm -hmm. So, because um, so we also have a solution for that. Mm. <laughs> so, but that will be for a different presentation. But so far, so we have designed our bandage um, to give 20 millimeters millimeters of mercury. Right now, it can right. be be designed to deliver basically any compression that you want, but 20 is safe for basically all patients, like invariant of your venous insufficiency, if you have some arterial insufficiency as well, uh, and also whether you're standing, sitting, lying down, it, it is safe and it's comfortable. And then if you need some higher s pressure when you're standing up, we have an additional hmm? solution. Cool. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I would like to hear more about that. Um, uh, one thing related to constant pressure or addressing the pressure itself, um, your your background or your hypothesis is based on this rather simple equation, which somehow assumes that the curvature is constant around the circumference of the leg. Now, at least my legs are a bit awkward or, or non-circular or non-cylindrical. So that should mean that I have uh, somewhat of a pressure distribution around the leg. So how important is that or how significant is that? Um, well, uh, um uh, first of all, yeah, you're correct. And this is much more um, evident in your leg that doesn't have an edema. Because, I mean, you have a pretty small radius over your shin bone. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but a patient with edema is, for first of all, a bit more circular. Uh, so that helps us, or helps the patients. But you will, of course, have local locally distribution uh, around the area. It doesn't vary at all that much, but over the shin bone, you will for sure in a skinny patient have a quite high pressure mm. um, uh, if you compare to the almost flat side on the outside of the leg. Uh, it's, it's difficult actually to measure with the pressure devices that we have available because they either they have a thickness, so you actually are influencing what you're measuring, or they are not able to pick it up. So we, we are not sure how, how much it differs, but it's within a, a few millimeters of mercury. Okay, it's, so not, it's not it, perhaps that. 10. It's, it's, it's not crazy. Hmm? Uh, it's yeah. also a standard procedure to, to use like polster material, like yeah. All right. some bulky yes. material mm -hmm. okay. to create a more circular. Um, yeah, you can make them more circular and also use that uh, to protect certain uh, sensitive areas. It's not uncommon. Right. Okay, I think uh, time is up for yep. our next break. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for we can discuss us. more thank in, the, in the break. Yeah. I, I, I can sympathize with, with putting on uh, compressive stockings. Uh, I use that for running and it takes like half a kilometer of time before I'm ready to go out. So maybe your, your stocking would be useful in that too. Uh, before we end, I would like to br bring or uh, yes, invite our moderator after the break to the stage. Uh, Bo Norman, who will be chairing our final session. So just to say hi to you, Bo. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, the next session will start 15.15. 15. 
will be all about innovation. I'm very glad to hear about Josefine, which is one of the projects we have previously supported from the Chalmers Innovation Office. So this kind of ties this together. And there'll be an interesting uh, <clears throat> series of talks and also a panel at the end with participants from Chalmers, from Sorgenska, from Sorgenska Science Park, from AstraZeneca. So do come back after the coffee break. We look forward to it. See you in uh, 30 minutes. <laughs>